when news reached Egypt's Queen Cleopatra of Caesar's victory over the Pompeian forces at the Battle of Thapsus, she made immediate preparations to journey to Rome. There, Cleopatra could strengthen Egypt's political relationship with Rome, and witness the bloody execution of her sister and rival, Princess Arsinoe IV, after seeing her paraded in chains as part of Caesar's triumphal procession. But the political etiquette of her position as Queen of Egypt mandated that it was not permissible for Cleopatra, her brother husband, King Ptolemy XIV, nor her son, Ptolemy Caesar, to cross Rome's sacred pomerium, which bordered the city. Instead, Caesar accommodated Cleopatra and her court in one of his luxurious villas on Tiber Island. From the villa's grand lodger, Cleopatra, and those guests she deemed worthy of an invitation, had a magnificent view of the Campus Martius, which was the starting point of the triumph, and the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the triumph's final destination. For Caesar's victories in Gaul, Egypt, Pontus, and Numidia, the Senate had approved four individual triumphs honoring each of the four kingdoms, upstaging the three triumphs over three kingdoms which had been celebrated by Pompeius Magnus in 60 BC. Caesar's first triumph celebrated his invasion and subjugation of Gaul. Wagons and floats carrying painted scenes depicting Caesar's successes against the migrating Helvetii, Ariovistus of the German Suebi, the Belgi, his miraculous victory at the Sabis River, and the uprising of the Venetii, rolled past cheering crowds. Following were even more floats depicting Caesar's forays across the Rhine River into Germany, and his much-publicized double invasion of Britannia, with its subsequent battle against the forces of Cassivellaunus. Amidst these painted scenes, which excited the roaring crowds, wagons full of Gallic treasure, armor, and weapons joined the spectacle alongside hundreds of Gauls who had been taken prisoner. Caesar's Gallic triumph culminated with images depicting his final coup de grace, the double siege of Elysia. Bringing up the rear was the Gergovian chieftain, Vercingetorix, who had been dubbed King of the Gauls. Following the prisoners, Caesar's legions marched, singing bawdy songs to the crowds that said, Lock up your daughters, we bring the bald whoremonger back to Rome. Every woman's man and every man's woman. Now the Gauls can exchange their trousers for the broad purple stripe of a toga, as Caesar leads them to the Senate house. But, as Caesar passed before the temple of the goddess Fortuna, dressed in his gold and purple bordered toga picta and wearing the laurel wreath of victory, one of the wheels of his antique triumphal chariot broke, and Caesar was cast to the ground before a horrified crowd. Fortuna, that goddess of luck who had taken Caesar as her pet, had just abandoned him. After a brief pause, during which a new chariot was hitched up to the horses, Caesar climbed back aboard and the triumph continued. However, concerned that his luck had run out, when his triumphal chariot reached the base of the stairs leading up to the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Caesar made a propitiatory sacrifice to Fortuna by climbing the hundreds of steps on his knees. At the top, the sacrificial bull was slaughtered to Jupiter, and Vercingetorix, who had awaited this moment for six years inside a cell within Rome's prison, known as the Tullianum, was strangled to death before the masses. His execution was followed by that of his cousin, Vercassivellornos, and the nameless remainder of Gallic prisoners. Along with the triumphal parade, Caesar scheduled entertainment and banquets throughout the city, including mock battles in the Circus Maximus, and free food and wine for the city's population. Caesar's second triumph began as the revelries of his Gallic celebration began dying down. One of the prerequisites in qualifying a general for a military triumph was the addition of new territory to Rome's total holdings. However, despite giving the Roman province of Cyprus back to the Egyptians, Caesar celebrated his victories in Alexandria against the forces of Cleopatra's first brother husband, King Ptolemy XIII. As with his Gallic triumph, the streets were flooded with floats and wagons, but these carried pure propaganda brilliantly displayed as inspirational scenes of Caesar jumping into the great harbour during the battle for the Heptastadion, his naval battle within the Alexandrian shoals against the forces of Arsinoe's commander, Ganymedes, and his great victory over the forces of Ptolemy XIII at the Battle of the Nile River. Along with strange Egyptian statues depicting half-human half-animal gods, and wagons overflowing with gold, 
Many Alexandrians taken prisoner also walked in this triumph, preceding Cleopatra's sister, who had been briefly dubbed Arsinoe the fourth queen of Egypt. The Romans, who were accustomed to seeing brawny, brave-looking, and formidable foes on display in their military parades, were taken aback by the sight of Arsinoe. Young and attractive, her hands bound in chains, Arsinoe carried herself with grace and dignity, winning for herself the heartfelt sympathy of the Roman people. Despite Cleopatra's political need to be rid of a potential rival queen who might one day rise at the rallying of Cleopatra's Egyptian opposition, Caesar was forced to give in to the will of the people as they chanted and shouted their cries for clemency, demanding that Caesar spare the young woman. In order to appease the people, Caesar exchanged Arsinoe's sentence of death by strangulation for one of exile to the great temple at Ephesus, where she was to live out her days as a priestess to the goddess Artemis. To complete the theme of his Egyptian triumph, Caesar had a portion of the campus Martius flooded, and mock naval battles were performed for the crowds, who continued to enjoy the non-stop feasting and drinking provided by the triumphator, Caesar. Several days later, Caesar celebrated his third triumph over the armies of Pharnaces at the Battle of Zella. Of Caesar's four triumphs, the least is known of this one as the historians are somewhat silent. Once again, no new territory was added to Rome through Caesar's campaign in Asia Minor, but territories stolen by King Pharnaces of the Bosporus were returned to Rome. Because Pharnaces, who fled back to the Bosporus following his defeat at the Battle of Zella, was killed by his son-in-law, Asander, Caesar had no conquered king to boast of in this portion of his triumph. So it's likely Caesar used the parade as a billboard to advertise his famous quote, Veni, Vidi, Vici, and remind the Roman people of his subjugation of Asia Minor in only five days. Accompanying the feasting and drinking, wild beast hunts featuring over 400 lions were featured on the list of entertaining activities for the people. But the non-stop revelry began to wear thin with the Roman people, many complaining of Caesar's wasteful extravagance. By the time Caesar's fourth triumph launched, celebrating his victories in Africa, the Roman people were growing weary from so much celebration. In an attempt to downplay the civil war, Caesar had presented this last triumph to the people as a victory over King Juba of Numidia, whom he made the scapegoat of the entire African campaign. But Caesar's diversionary tactics failed. One of the very first floats to pass by the crowds was a larger-than-life depiction of Quintus Cecilius Metellus Scipio stabbing himself in the stomach before throwing himself into the sea. This float was soon followed by a depiction of Marcus Petrius taking his own life at mealtime, after having duelled King Juba to death. But when the float passed by which showed the horrific scene of Marcus Porcius Cato disemboweling himself with his own hands, the people of Rome had had enough and were greatly offended. Caesar was not celebrating a victory over a foreign enemy, he was celebrating and memorialising the horrific deaths of fellow Roman citizens who had given their very lives in service to Rome's Republic. Although King Juba did not survive to walk in Caesar's African triumph, Caesar assigned Juba's two-year-old son as the new king of Numidia. When the crowds witnessed the two-year-old, whose name was also Juba, in chains being carried through the streets, they began to hiss and boo at the very thought that a child should be executed as the conclusion of the triumph. Once again, as with Princess Arsinoe, Caesar was forced to relent and capitulate to the crowd's demands that the infant be spared. Caesar made the two-year-old King Juba an official Roman hostage, and Juba was taken into Caesar's household to live. Among the parallel feasts and celebrations which coincided with this fourth triumph, Caesar exhibited a battle between two groups of twenty African war elephants. And again, more criticism came from the people over Caesar's extravagance, waste of money, and waste of animals' lives, all in the name of entertainment and propaganda. In one venue held on the campus Martius, two men got into a fight. This altercation led to the eruption of a riot which only died down when Caesar took the two men into custody and commanded priests to sacrifice them right there on the campus Martius. The Romans abhorred human sacrifice almost as much as they abhorred kings and queens. Caesar, however, had been named dictator for ten years, with guaranteed prosecutorial immunity. He had also been granted the honour of holding the consulship for five years. 
In addition to these, the Senate had bestowed on Caesar the office of censor for three years, with the full right to appoint or remove senators as he saw fit. With his triumphs now at an end, and the civil wars concluded, it was time for Caesar to discharge this authority in the interest of creating a more balanced government, and to finally repay the huge debts he owed to the legions who had paid dearly to make Caesar the undisputed master of Rome.